Hello everyone, my name is Professor Fazan Ali. Welcome back to Research Beast. Today I will be discussing something very interesting that we are all very well familiar with, and that is Google Scholar. Um, I'm sure that some of you may already know this because there's been some sharings on social media. Um, so Google Scholar, Google um, very quietly dropped uh, something called the Google Scholar Lab, which is the new AI-powered extension inside the Google Scholar platform. But before we go into this, let me roll my intro, and then we can go from there. All right, welcome back. So um, let's um, break it down a little bit. So I'm sure that all of us are very well familiar with uh, Google Scholar. Of course, we all use it for our literature review and for our search and all those type of things. Um, and everybody is quite well familiar with the uh, layout and with how you are searching for papers, and, um, different conference papers, and in generally literature about academic field. Um, so for the first time in years, uh, what Google uh, Scholar has done, they have brought in an update some of you may already see it on your Google Scholar. Some of you may not be able to see it yet because it's on rolling basis. Um, it's not a small change. It's really a big change, even though I have some opinions about it that I'll talk about uh, in this video towards the end. But um, like I said, Google Scholar has brought this thing called Scholar Lab. So if you log into your Google Scholar, you should see it on the page, which I'll share my screen just in a moment, and I'll show you how it actually looks like. So from here, uh, what it means is that instead of um, searching for literature on Google Scholar using Boolean operators like and, or, not, those type of things, or just putting in phrases, now you can actually ask Google Scholar a question, just like how we use ChatGPT or any other generative AI uh, platforms. So you would simply ask Google Scholar a question, and then Google Scholar will use its own database for different type of papers that it has in order to bring in the most relevant papers or to generate um, summaries of those papers. And then you can obviously continue uh, your conversation with Google Scholar as you move along, right? So this is kind of what the idea is. Uh, let me share my screen very quickly and show you how it, it basically looks like, uh, right? So, okay, so this is basically how it looks like. So if you look here very clearly, this is my own Google Scholar page. So if you can see right here, this is the button that basically um, says that you can use Google Scholar, right? So Scholar Labs. Now, if you want to read about it a little bit more, here's a link and you can simply open this link. And when you open this link, it kind of shows you how you can use it. Uh, but we can also try to do it. I haven't used it a bit uh, so far. I thought it's a cool idea because I used it once or twice. Uh, but then I also looked at some of my friends sharing stuff on about it on LinkedIn and on uh, social media. So I thought, OK, let's really look into this a little bit deeper. So um, here's kind of what it looks like. So when you click on it, it says, ask a detailed research question to find relevant papers. Now, if I go in here, I can simply um, uh, right here, something, let's say, how do customers develop their trust towards generative AI recommendations? So if I just put this one and let's see what do we get here. Um, so it takes a little bit of time because obviously it is live database and then it needs to go into that. And here it would also show you um, that's looking at 12, 15, 20 different ideas and then picking up the top three results. Um, so right now we have some of this stuff here, right? So um, I'll just let it do its thing and then we'll see how it is going to come up to us. So, uh, all right, so it's just kind of looking for more and more results. I'll just give it some time to see how it is going to go from here. So as I understand, I think basically what happens is that it looks for the top 10 results or something. Um, you know, basically whatever the results are, again, I'm giving it some time to kind of give, it's still processing. So we'll just leave it there for a while. Um, 
but I'll just talk to you about some of the features that Google Scholar Labs have. The first thing, obviously, is the natural language search, which means that you are using large language models as an augmented tool to search for papers and search for literature, which is great. So you are not searching and all those type of things. You are just simply writing a question, and then the Scholar Lab converts it into um, a search query and then gives you the best results that it has for that type of uh, question that you have asked. Again, I mean, it's still doing its search, so I am not, you know, teasing it. I'll just let it be how it is. Okay, so I think now we have everything that we have. So um, if I look here, um, it gave me all these important papers about the question that I asked, right? So how do customers develop their trust? It gives me these 10 results. Uh, so I have some of these um, results, right? So now what I can do is I can um, look at these papers for now, even though I read something online about it, some people said that so far it's looking at a lot of um, predatory journals and things like that, which here in my search it shows there's an elsewhere journal, which is a pretty good journal, uh, Technology and Society, Journal of Decision Systems. Um, then again, Business Strategy and Environment. So all of those are really good journals. So. I don't have a problem with that, uh, but how, um, what uh, determinants of this trust, let's see if it's going to go deeper into these papers that it has found, right? So it's again, kind of same layout, like we are chatting with um, ChatGPT, so we do the same thing with Google Scholar. But again, let it do its stuff. Um, coming back to the features of it, so like I said, it's natural language processing augmented search, but it also then gives us um, AI-generated summaries. Um, as I read about it in the blog entry for Google Scholar, we'll try to look into how do you generate those summaries um, about what those papers are and you know what are the main findings and why it matters and kind of those type of ideas. Um, like we just asked a follow-up question. So obviously the follow-up questions are there, which is again a great idea. You are basically interacting with the results coming out of Google Scholar, which was not possible before this. Um, and then obviously it's integrated directly into Google Scholar, right? You, it's not like you're hopping from platform to platform, platform to platform. You're basically working everything inside Google Scholar, which is great. Now, the limitation of course is as I see, like every time you ask a question, it basically gives you 10 results, right? So it's uh, sticking to 10 results at a time, which can be a limitation because obviously, you know, you are not looking at the entire picture of the literature, but just a snapshot of it. Uh, but still better than nothing. So that that is really, really great. Um, the other thing is about um, the quality of the papers, like I mentioned, some of my friends who did write about it on social media, they complain about the quality of the journals. However, what I see here, it's kind of pretty decent journals. I mean, I don't understand why some people complain about the journals, but again, Google is this behemoth of a technology company. So I'm sure that they're constantly working on improving the quality of the responses and stuff like this. So, because whatever I see here, these are not bad journals at all, like AI and Society, it's a great journal. And then Journal of Decision Systems, Media, media Business Studies, Behavioral Sciences, now, yes, now there is something that you can obviously um, uh, comment on, and that is I do see some of MDPI journals. Now, obviously, MDPI is a polarizing subject. Um, I personally do not engage anything with MDPI. There are results out of MDPI, and that's up to the researcher to make a decision whether you want to cite those papers or not, right? So this is kind of what we have. Um, you can also say that it may not give you the key papers in the area. Um, it basically does its query, and I don't know what the search parameters are, like how does it rank the papers and give you the papers, but now you may say that you know it's not really giving you um, the best papers um, about that particular topic or whatever, right? So uh, now another thing which is very, uh, you know, I think it's it's a thing not with only Google Scholar, but any type of generative uh, AI platform. If you give the same query, twice, it may not give you the same results, right? So obviously the type of papers you will get every time, even if you are using the same query, the type of papers would be different, right? So again, it's for the researcher to make a decision on whether you're using these papers or whether you're not using these papers, right? So that is kind of what we have. Now, if I um, go a little bit deeper into this, let's try to see if we can kind of engage 
uh, more with this. So let's say I open this paper, see where it takes us. If it takes us directly to the paper, of course, then that means it's a dead end. We cannot really communicate with the paper. Um, but I'll just click on this link and see, um, OK, so it takes us directly to the paper. Now, what's cool is that obviously with these papers, um, you still have Scopus has its own, um, and Science Direct has its own AI assistant. So obviously, you can engage with this even. But I would be more interested into really asking it to see if it can summarize the literature. And if it cannot, then it would be just like the AI um, capability is only for giving you the papers or whatnot, right? So I won't see a lot of utility into that. Um, but let's see. OK, so all right, so I get it. So it's not really summarizing anything to you, right? So it's basically, it's just keep giving you the papers and stuff like that, which is, in my opinion, good, but not wonderful. Because again, the, the problem is it's just listing the papers. You still have to go and look into the papers, right? I was thinking if it can kind of convert it into conversational stuff, we can at least you know make some use of it. Um, if I go into here. OK, so it says that um, ask detailed research question to find relevant papers. All right, so it's purely um, such. So I think the only utility into this Google Scholar Lab would be to really automate your search process to some extent using natural language processing and large, large language models, but nothing more than that. So I think that um, right now there are kind of a lot more, um, I, I would say, better platforms, even though they are not as powerful as Google Scholar because the amount of papers that they have in their database, but there are platforms that have made this literature process fairly easier. Um, so I think um, if somebody were to ask me, um, should they use Google Scholar or not, uh, I would honestly looking at what I, I see right now, and believe me, it's also my second time using Google Scholar Labs, um, I think that obviously there are some benefits of this. Um, I think it would be great for early stage exploration. So if you have an idea or a research question, just to explore it a little bit to see what type of research is done on that, um, just to get a quick sense of the topic. Um, it's great if you are a professor and if you are asking your students to do some basic research on a particular topic, I think this is great for that. Um, it's also great for coming up with discussion questions based on some uh, basic literature about a particular topic. Um, and I think if you have a meeting and you haven't done <laughs> a good job of preparing for that research meeting, you can actually do this one to just have a very quick uh, you know, feel for what you need to talk. So I think this is great. But I think where the limitations are, again, based on what I see here, the limitations, in my opinion, would be that it is not really a great tool for creating a formal literature review or meta-analysis or systematic literature review. Obviously, it's not. It's also not great for tracking specific papers to see how they are cited, who cited them, why they cited them, and stuff like that. And I don't think you should use this you know, if you are working towards a high-quality paper just to create some kind of um, great literature review or whatnot, right? So I think that's not good. Now, what I see here, something very interesting is that based on what questions I asked, for is, for example, how do customers develop their trust rules and rate recommendations? Not only does it recommend the paper, but it kind of takes out some stuff from it. I wouldn't trust it 100%. You would still have to open the paper and kind of see if these things are written and they're just to avoid hallucination and stuff. But I think um, this is great uh, because it, it opens it up to you. When you read, it, uh, when you read this, these bullets, it would also give you some idea of whether you should actually go deeper into this paper or not. Right? So I think that that would be the benefit of this. But that's pretty much it. I think that um, it's a good tool. It's a great tool. Again, we would understand that it's an experimental tool, so it's not fully rolled out yet. Obviously, Google must be working on this to, to improve this and all that. Um, but that's pretty much it. And I think you should definitely use it depending on whatever stage you are in for your research. And if you try Google Scholar Labs, please let me know your experience in the comments, um, especially if it helps you or if it confuses you. Uh, and in the end, if you are new here to this video or to this channel, I hope you enjoy this. I will do more videos like this for AI-based tools for research. 
Um, make sure that you like the video and you subscribe to the channel. And until then, take care of yourself. We'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.